When you were a child, did you ever recite this little nursery rhyme? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Well, part of what it means to grow up in life is to discover that, yes, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can also hurt. In fact, sometimes words can do more damage than even sticks or stones or fists. Many people today are concerned about the breakdown in civil discourse in our society, the way we speak about each other in our public and political life. A politician isn't content just to state his views. No, he demonizes his opponent, calling him a traitor or evil or a liar. A radio talk show host doesn't like the opinions of one of the callers, and he hangs up on the caller, calling her a pathetic fool. A busy clerk in a fast food restaurant accidentally leaves the french fries out of the order, and the customer doesn't just point this out, but calls the clerk an idiot, a jerk. Someone carelessly cuts in front of another driver on the interstate, and the offended motorist roars up alongside the other driver and mouths obscenities through the window. Our words become daggers of hate. Or again, how many people walk around with the scars caused by terrible teases and taunts they heard when they were children? You're stupid, you're ugly, you're fat. Painful words, and the words and wounds can last a lifetime. Several years ago, a sad story made the news. A teenage girl took her own life when some people who were jealous of her bullied her on the internet writing words on her social media page for all to see. Day after day they wrote, you're a bad person, I hate you, everybody hates you, the world would be a better place without you. Until finally the girl couldn't take the pressure and humiliation anymore. Today many parents and teachers are very concerned about an epidemic of what has come to be called cyberbullying, hateful words by anonymous people. Words designed to shame and humiliate other people spread like garbage across the internet. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but cruel words hurt too. Not all hurtful words come from cruelty. Sometimes harmful words can happen even in loving relationships. I'm the father of two grown children, a son and a daughter. Both of them are now mature and wonderful people. They're parents themselves. Many of you who have grown up children know how wonderful it is to form adult to adult relationships with your own children, but forming those adult relationships with your children sometimes means going back over some painful memories in the past. For example, my daughter reminded me of a time long ago when she was a teenager, and she and I were in some kind of father-daughter argument. We soon made up and all was well, but my daughter remembers that in the heat of the moment, I snapped at her. Melanie, you're nothing but trouble to me. That's not the kind of thing I would say. My daughter, light of my life, heart of my heart, nothing but trouble. I don't remember saying that, but she does. And 25 years later, she's still trying to take that poison dart out of her heart. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can also hurt me. The scripture knows about the power of our words to do good things and also to do harmful things. The writer of the book of James, for example, marvels that often out of the very same mouth come beautiful blessings and hateful cursings. The same human mouth, he says, can say praise the Lord one moment and then say damn you to people made in the image of God. He says that this should not be so that our words should be peaceable, gentle, full of mercy, and that when they are, we receive a harvest of peace and righteousness. Well, that's a good thought, of course, that our words should become peaceful and gentle, but how is that possible? We live, after all, in the real world of frustrations and irritations, conflicts and competition. We're, after all, human beings. We're not angels. We sometimes speak before we think. We sometimes let our emotions get the best of us. How can our speech be different? How can our words produce what James promises, a harvest of righteousness? Well, if our words are to become vessels of blessing and not daggers of hate, it's going to take some hard work and some practice. Peaceful words don't just roll naturally out of our mouths. We have to practice using words of peace. 
In the 1930s, when the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer was serving as the head of a small school for pastors, he proposed a remarkable rule for how the people living together in that community, the faculty and students alike, ought to talk. No person in the community, he said, should talk about another person in the community, even if they mean to say something good, unless that other person is present to hear what is said. Think about that. No person should talk about another person in the community, even if they mean to say something good, unless that other person is present to hear what is said. If Bonhoeffer's rule were observed today, there'd be no gossip, no secret whispering about others, no strategy meetings on how to handle difficult people, no conversations that start. I think we should pray for Randall because no speculations about whether or not Alice is a control freak, not even any private sharing about how best to help, help Frank and Marilyn through their marriage problems. Everything would be out in the open, in the sunlight, and truthful. But did this rule work? Well, a man who was one of the students at Bonhoeffer School reported that in fact they utterly failed to keep that rule. But he said, their attempts to keep the rule and their resolving to try again when they fail to keep the rule transformed the community. He said the students and the faculty, in trying to make their speech open and truthful, learned as much about the nature of God as they did from sermons and Bible studies. So peaceful and loving words can come from hard work and practice, being careful about our speech. But hard work and practice are not the deepest source of merciful and tender speech. The deepest truth about our speech is that no one can truly speak loving words to others who has not heard loving words spoken about them. When Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened, and the voice of God spoke, This is my Son, my beloved Son. I'm well pleased with Him. Listen to what God said about His Son. This is my Son, my beloved Son. I'm well pleased with Him. How much pain in the world has been caused because so many people have never heard anyone speak such words about them. How every human being yearns in our hearts to hear that kind of word said about us. The good news of the gospel is that the words God spoke about Jesus, God has spoken about each one of us, about me, about you. This is my child, my daughter. This is my son in whom I have delight. God has said that about you. You're my child. I delight in you. In that blessing from God, there is forgiveness, forgiveness for the careless and hurtful words we've sometimes spoken, even to people we love. And also in that blessing from God, there is the power to speak to others in a new way, with peace and gentleness. It's out of God's good word for and about us that words of blessings flow from us for others. Because when we realize the blessing that God has spoken about us, we see that blessing also in other people. There's an old saying that if we really knew how to look in every person we meet, we would see angels in front of them saying, make way for the image of God, make way for the image of God. Several years ago, on the anniversary of the September 11th disaster, National Public Radio's oral history project, StoryCorps, broadcast the story of John Vigiano, a retired New York City firefighter who lost two sons at the World Trade Center, Joe, a police officer, and John Jr., a firefighter like himself. When the younger son, Joe, was 17, he started dating a young woman whose father was a police officer. Joe admired his girlfriend's father and was inspired to take the police test. Joe Sr. was shocked. Son, he said, you're only 17 years old. To which Joe replied, no big deal. John Jr., on the other hand, did not start out wanting to be a fireman. Rather, he wanted to be a millionaire, the next Donald Trump. And as a man of means, he would take care of his mother and father. But then his father came down with throat cancer, and John Jr. saw how his father's fire company rallied around him and gave him support. John Jr. was moved by this and changed vocational goals, deciding to become a firefighter like his dad. John Vigiano was close to his two sons and would talk to them by phone nearly every day. Around 3.30 p.m. on September the 10th, 2001, John spoke to John Jr. 
The call ended with John saying, I love you, and his saying, I love you too. The next morning, when the first plane hit, Joe was called to the World Trade Center. He phoned his father on the way, telling him what was happening. That call also ended with, I love you. John Vigiano closed his story by saying, we had the boys for John for 36 years, Joe for 34 years. I don't have any coulda, shoulda, would'ves. I wouldn't have changed anything. It's not many people that the last words they said to their son or daughter was, I love you. Even in his grief, Joe Vigiano is at peace because the last words he ever spoke to his sons were, I love you. You could even say, he has a harvest of righteousness. God's first word and God's last word about us is, this is my child, my beloved, in whom I delight. And so because of that blessing, when we open our mouths to speak to our neighbors, our children, our loved ones, the people who cross our paths every day, we're empowered to speak words of gentleness and peace, mercy, and blessing.